Well, hello, everybody. Great to see you. Thanks for coming out. You guys uh, beat the time clock and beat the snow and the big winter apocalypse we had this morning. You guys are acting like it was a big snowstorm. But I'm glad you made it to church. Hey, we are so glad you're here. It is uh, week number six of a series called The Jesus Way. But before I jump into that, you heard on the news, Growth Track uh, is today because uh, it's the second Sunday. So we're on step two of our three-part membership class called The Growth Track. First week we talk about this is who Heartland is, what we're about, what our vision is. Uh, the second week we talk about you and how you can discover your spiritual gifts. Most people have no idea the divine enablement God has put inside of them to do the work that God's called you to do. And if you don't ever find your purpose, the thing that God put inside you to do, you'll be missing out on the fulfillment that you've been looking for. So we try to help every person figure out what is it that God has put inside of you, believing that, you know, th that, that gifting is part of your destiny. So we're gonna do that today, right after this service in the chapel. I'm teaching that live. If you're new to our church, I'd love to meet you. Um, so glad that you're here. Also, Easter's coming, so it's just a few weeks away, and inside of your program, we have these um, little Easter invitations that you can use to invite somebody to come to church. Listen, there is no better time of the whole year than Easter. Actually, I, I do three, three series a year at the movies, which is in the fall, the Christmas, big Christmas Eve service, and then Easter, where I am speaking specifically to people who don't know Christ and they're far from God. And I'm, I'm really preparing to reach your friends, your family, the people you love who are far from God. So I wanna encourage you to partner with me and tell as many people as you can that you can come on Friday night. That's gonna be our communion service of the Easter weekend. So you can be a part of that. Saturday, we have a service at four, and then we'll have three on Sunday, a nine, a 10.30, and a noon service. And I hope you'll participate, you'll make room. Uh, but if you invite somebody, go to the service that they wanna to go to, you have permission. I want to, to fill this place with people who have never been here before. So take advantage of that great opportunity. Hey, it's time for the offering, time for us to give to the Lord. So it's not a uh, business transaction, it's actually part of your worship. I really believe that not everything God has put into my hands is for me. And I wonder if you believe that too, that God has blessed you to be a blessing to others. And when you put God first, you bring your life into order where he's in first place and that provides blessing over every part of your life. So today, if you'd like to give and be a part of this worship opportunity, all the different ways to give are on the screen. And there is a, a cool way to do it. If you text the word give to 68,000, uh, it'll take you right to the giving page and all of the different options are there, ways to give. But if you scroll a little further, it will show you where your giving is going, all the impact. And I was so delighted today, uh, this last week, to see a quarter of a million dollars leave our church and go into all of our outreach partners for this quarter in our city, into our nation, around the world. And we can do that because of your generosity. We are so blessed to be a blessing. And I think that's one of the reasons why God blesses our church is because we give a full 10% of everything. The first 10% goes all the way uh, to all of our partners. And then we're good stewards of what you give to us. We, we run this church on about 68 to 70% of the revenue that comes in so that we can pay off the debt that we have, which is our mortgage. Everybody has a mortgage, but we're doing it in record time so that we can one day even be able to give more away and bless others. So if you'd like to worship God and be a part of the offering today, I never, I never want you to see it as some transaction. It's worship to God. So uh, let's, just, let's just offer that right now. When, whenever you gave or whenever you're going to give, let's get our heart right about it. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. Thank you for the ability to think, to work, for education, for the opportunities, for the connections, the network, the creativity. You've given us the ability to move and to have function in our bodies today. We just give you praise for waking us up. You've been so good. And today, Lord, we want to put you in first place. We give to you out of the abundance of what you've given to us. We pray that you'd use it to touch people's lives, to help them know you. Thank you for setting people free. Thank you for helping them discover their purpose. Ultimately, thank you, Lord, for how you're going to use this church and all of our lives together to make a difference in the world. So we thank you for what you've given to us. We give it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right. Pastor John's going to come out. I asked him to sing a song I haven't heard in about a decade. We used to sing this song called Open the Eyes of My Heart. And then I thought about this old hymn that I used to sing when I was a kid called Open My Eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. And I invite you to do that right now as a prayer as we get ready for the Word of God. Open my eyes, Lord. Open our eyes, Lord. We want to see Jesus. To reach out and touch Him. And say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and tell Him we love Him. Oh, And help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, oh Lord. We want to see Jesus. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. So pour out your power in love as we sing holy, holy, holy to see you high lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. So pour out your power in love as we sing holy, holy, holy. So we sing holy 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 god you're holy 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 you're so holy 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 and i want to see you jesus you're holy 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 One more time, sing holy, come on. Lord, you're holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Magnificent and holy. I want to see you. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's what happens when you worship God yes, is you Lord. see him. Yes, Lord. Lord, you're so holy. You're so good. You're so wonderful. I've let the things of this world get so big. I've let the problems and the issues and the busyness of life get large. But when I step into your house and I begin to worship the Lord and I lift my voice to you and I sing your praises, you right size everything. You are lifted up. You are great and greatly to be praised. Today we pray that now that we've been here that you'd silence the voice of every accuser. Let there be no interruption. I pray you'd bring a, a moment of peace into our lives where we can hear the voice of your spirit. We, we breathe you in, we are still, we know that you are God. You're in this place. Speak to our hearts now in Jesus' name, amen. This uh, sermon that we are studying is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And Jesus, seeing the crowds, he went up on a mountain, and not everybody wants to go with him. 
So not everybody wants to be a doer of the word. Lots of people want to hear or show up for the show, but not everybody wants to be a disciple. And that's what this series is all about. Can we, can we leave our way and get on the Jesus way? And so Jesus stepping up the mountain, he begins to teach his disciples. And this is a whole series about who we are becoming is more important than what we're doing. I, listen, so many of us, we spend our lives worrying about what we're doing for God. And some of you even get consumed with the bad things that you think you're doing that God's not pleased of. And this, this is one of those great sermons where God says, stop worrying about what you're doing. He doesn't put a purity test on his followers. He just says, why don't you come, come higher? Why don't you come walk with me and get close to me and come see some things? So he just invites his disciples to come. And some of them climb. And when, he, when they climb up the mountain, he says to them, hey, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, blessed are those who recognize their need for God because they're the ones that are going to have heaven come into their lives. So almost like he said, good job. You're, you're already on your way. Like you're, you're already beginning to grow just because you stepped away from the crowd. And then he said, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And blessed are those who, um, are the, who are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So here's this little progression that we've seen so far as we started. It was, I recognize my need for God. I'm walking with Jesus now, and as he touches the broken things in the world, I'm, I'm seeing something's got to change. Things can't stay the way that they are. God wants to bless you, but he can't bless you as long as you're just thinking about you and what's going on in your life. So as you walk with Jesus a while, he'll open up your mind and start seeing some things that are beyond you. And then somewhere along the way, you'll go, wait, <laughs> I need to change. One of the things about these disciples, as they got close to Jesus, they, they started recognizing how far their hearts were from God. So Peter says one time, he says, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. So there's a humility that's, that's involved in all of these first three. If you had one word to sum up the first three verses of the Sermon on the Mount, it's God blesses the humble. God blesses people who recognize their need for him, who recognize something's got to change in this world and I'm, I'm okay with seeing it. Wait, I need to change. And then he moves into this second triplet. The, these Beatitudes comes in, there's nine of them and there's, there are three sets of three. So here's the second three that we started a couple weeks ago. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. That was last week. And today, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. We're living in a world that is obsessed with purity. Think about it. Everybody's obsessing about, I need to drink pure water. I need to eat pure food. I need to have pure cosmetics. I need to buy pure products. It is an obsession. Just the water industry alone is going to be a $50 billion industry by the end of this decade. That's a lot of money going to provide people with pure water. And now we're so concerned about the food that we eat. Is it pure? You can have apps on your phone when you go to the grocery store and it will tell you how pure your food is just by scanning it. So you scan the top ramen noodle pack and it's zero out of 100. <laughs> but you scan that soap that you just bought, it's 100 out of 100. And then people are obsessing about this in strange ways. Like somebody sent me an article this week that said uh, uh, one of the Kardashians and Haley Bieber are doing IV therapy weekly of pure water into their bodies so that they will have maximum hydration. That's crazy. <laughs> but that's what people are doing today. I want to be, I want pure everything going into my body. In fact, in the same article, they sent a picture because the Kardashians were showing off their greens fridge. Because this is a thing now, you need to have clean produce. I mean, come on, you gotta have, look at this picture. This is the show fridge in the house. That's some healthy looking produce, right? Because we're so concerned about what we're putting into our bodies. You gotta have, you know, because we're plant powered now and BPA free and GMO free and what else? Organic, what else? 
Gluten-free, yeah, there's no gluten in that. <laughs> We've gotta have, we, we want purity in our lives, and so this is the, they're showing off their, their greens fridge. There's kale and limes and asparagus and all kinds of lettuce and beans, and looks like there's some basil up there, so it's very healthy looking. Kind of hypocritical, though, because this is only part of the fridge, because when you zoom out and you see the whole picture, you've got the greens fridge next to the haagen fridge right there, <laughs> side by side. Because, <laughs> you know, you got to have your guilty pleasure fridge, too. And I saw that, and I thought, this is a picture of our Instagram-curated perfect lives that we want everybody to see. We show the green fridge, but we don't really show people the guilty indulgence fridge, right? Because we want our lives to be pure and look great for everybody, but come on, everybody has that little guilty indulgence that they'll go after once in a while. And this is what this, this sermon is about, is God is saying, blessed are the pure in heart. But the pure in heart stands as a conclusion of three verses. So the first verse was, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. God blesses people who go all in. Like, I want everything in my life to be right. I'm going after righteousness. You know, if you would just give one year of your life and go all in, and quit just dating God, you know, just a little bit here and there, or just sampling it. But if you would go all in just for one year of your life, your life would dramatically change. You would taste and see that God is good. Go all in. But you have to pair going all in with God and his righteousness with the second beatitude here, which is the desire for mercy. Because if those th two things don't go together, a person who goes after righteousness hard invariably becomes a self-righteous person. There is nothing more beautiful than righteousness, and there is nothing more ugly than self-righteousness. So people who go after God and go all in, it's not long before they're looking at other people going, well, what's their problem? <laughs> I mean, I'm going after God, I'm putting the time in, I went to all 21 days of the 21 days of prayer. And you can't pray three minutes. <laughs> uh, or or I, I, you memorized the Bible verse? Well, I memorized like a whole book of the Bible, you know? And pretty soon we begin to get self-righteous with other people. And I don't know why we do this, but our self-righteousness bleeds out. And if you go to church long enough, you'll find people who have, they're dropping their spiritual resume all the time. They're talking about how they're going after God and how, and this can become a culture. We live in a culture today that is obsessing about righteousness. I mean, we gotta keep the, the world out and we've gotta keep that, them out of our houses, keep them out of our churches, keep them out of our schools, keep, keep the world out. And God's going, I don't know why you're being so self-righteous because look at this, everybody. The Bible says not even one person is righteous. There's nobody. Everybody's got, every, you may have your greens fridge out on display but you got a haagen fridge too. Everybody's got something. There's nobody that's righteous. In fact, God saved us because he knew we would never be righteous enough. God, God doesn't just wink at our sin or say, ah, it doesn't matter. No, he cares about right and wrong. He's a righteous God, a righteous judge. He's gonna do right every time. So instead of charging us with our sin, Jesus comes and he pays for our sin. The punishment goes upon him. So he receives a punishment so I won't have to. Mm -hmm. So it says he saved us not because of the righteous things that we did. Even if you go all in, it's not enough. Not enough. He saved us because of his mercy. That's why righteousness and mercy always have to go together. And that's what the, that's what the last verse of these three it's, that's what, how it ties it all together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be fully fulfilled. They'll be satisfied. But blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And so it's the pairing of righteousness, righteousness and mercy that, it, that, that results in a pure heart. God doesn't divide. It's a, it's a person who doesn't divide between righteousness and mercy which is such a beautiful thing. If you ever see a person that's perfectly righteous and perfectly merciful at the same time, 
It's hard to see in this world. We tend to go one way or the other. Some of you are very merciful, and mercy without righteousness is very mushy. <laughs> but righteousness without mercy is very self-righteous and ugly. It's, it's condescending, it's critical, it's hard. There are people that are so hard on other people that, that have shortcomings and have problems and have issues, and they can't see it. So the blend of both is what makes a pure heart. It's not being perfect in your heart, it's just that you, you're real, you, you're, you're holding on to this desire to go after God with all your heart, but you're also, man, I needed mercy in my life. And we need both. It's driven home to me at the grandson sleepover again this week. When the grandbabies came over, the grandsons, and you know, when it's time for bed, there's a side of me that tends to come out, which I'm more about righteousness. Like it's bedtime, it's time to go to bed. My wife on the, Gigi on the other hand, <laughs> is all about the mercy. Let's stay up. So, so this, is the, this is the dance. I want to watch TV, says little Graham. And Gigi says, oh, well, you can stay up. And I'm like, no, he needs to go to bed. And she's like, oh, let him stay up. And he's going, I want to watch Cars. And I go, you need to go to bed. It's time to go to bed. And he puts on this little fuss, and Gigi can't handle the fuss. So she says, it's okay, and gets him some ice cream or whatever. <laughs> so they watch TV. So, you know, last week at the sleepover, I just went to bed. I gave up. I'm like, okay, I'm not fighting this. And hours later, they're still watching TV. And everybody had a bad day the next day, including Gigi. <laughs> On the other hand, just coming in with righteousness didn't seem to work, because this week I'm like, okay, we're gonna do this different. It's bedtime. I wanna watch TV. Nope, it's time to go to bed. We gotta go to bed. And the meltdown started to happen. And I said, no, 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 it's just bedtime. I wanna watch Cars. I wanna watch Toy Story. And I just know it's bedtime. And I wasn't getting anywhere, and I was getting a little frustrated, wondering what am I gonna do, because I'm just the, the poppy. I don't, I'm not gonna do anything either. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say, here, it's your grandson, and give it to Gigi, and I'll just go to bed. But my 23-year-old daughter who's watching uh, us not knowing what to do, she is an exceptional needs teacher over at HSC High School. So she decides to step in and take charge. And she says, now Grammy, it's time to go to bed, no more TV, but you can have uh, a story or you can play with your toys. Which choice would you like? And he goes, I wanna watch TV. And he goes, no, TV's not one of your choices. You can choose a story or you can choose not to play with your toys. Which one will you choose? This went on about two minutes, and finally she goes, which one will you choose, a story or your toys? And the little lip quivers, and he goes, story? <laughs> and then she goes, good, that's a good choice. Let's get a book out. And then he goes, milkies? And she goes, yeah, you can have milk with your, with your uh... and I'm sitting here amazed. I'm like, how did you do that? <laughs> and she said, it's nothing. I negotiate with terrorists all day long, so. <laughs> <laughs> I was amazed. It was like the picture. I was, thank God for this beautiful illustration. You can have mercy and you can have righteousness and you just got to be smart. Apparently we're dumb. We don't know what we're doing. We've been relegated to the Gigi Poppy world. Hey, just don't kill your kids. Better ones are coming. Okay. That's... <laughs> but do you know who is the perfect blend of truth and mercy? It's Jesus. This is the picture. This is a series about the Jesus way, how we're, who we're becoming is more important than what we're doing. And he says, follow me, get on the way with me because I want to make you like me. God comes into the world, John says, full of grace and truth. He's, he's both. And I want you to imagine Jesus who's never sinned, never did anything wrong. He's perfectly righteous and he's not irritated at all the imperfection around him. Sometimes when we perceive that we're doing all right, or we've got our righteousness down, we get irritated at other people who are not. But that's not Jesus' way at all. Jesus, who is perfect, doesn't sin, doesn't, didn't, didn't come to, he says, I came to fulfill every part of the law, I didn't come to destroy it, but he's so merciful with people. He's, he sits and eats with the sinners, and he, he blocks for those who've been caught in sexual sin. And he, 
he, he ministers to, he touches lepers. I mean, he's, he's wading into all of the mess and the hurt. And he's not, he's not concerned the outside is not going to corrupt me. He knows who he is. So he's the perfect balance of righteousness and mercy. Now, the religious people of the day, they had no category for that. The, the, the Pharisees, which that has come to mean a certain word in our culture, right? The Pharisees, they had like 630 rules, laws, and they kept them to the letter. And they were constantly on Jesus like, what are you doing? And Jesus going, I just healed a guy who was paralyzed for like 40 years. And they're like, yeah, but it's the Sabbath. You, you can't break that rule. Or Jesus, you touched a leper. That's, that's wrong. You can't, you touch someone who's, who, who has a disease. And Jesus is like, yeah, and I healed him too. So what is the opposite of the pure in heart? Opposite of the pure in heart is a hypocrite. And a hypocrite is somebody who acts religious, but they're not really righteous at all. A hypocrite is somebody who says everything's going right, but it's really not right in their heart. A hypocrite is somebody who's pretending. The word, it literally means play actor. So I put on a mask. I, I act one way, but in my heart, I'm a different person. So these Pharisees, Jesus calls them out. He, he sees this self-righteous behavior. People who love to do things for show. There was no Instagram in that day, but they would have had thousands of followers. I mean, they lived their life for the approval of people. And they're, they're, they're so consumed with their righteousness, but on the inside, they're just full of judgmentalism and they're filled with criticism and they're just awful. Look what Jesus says to them. He comes out at them and he says, woe to you Pharisees, you hypocrites. For you are just people who cleanse up the outside of the dish, but inside you're full of extortion and indulgence, self-indulgence. Woe to you Pharisees, you hypocrites. <laughs> and he gives them the biggest insult of the day. He says, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. Imagine if somebody called you that. You're like, you look nice on the outside, but inwardly you're a rotting grave. You appear beautiful on the outside, but inside it's like you're full of dead man's bones. You outwardly appear righteous, but you're filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. I wonder how they felt about that. I, they probably didn't like it. <laughs> People have a problem when you point out they're a Pharisee, even today. And I think people are having a hard time. Maybe, maybe today, I wonder if you'll have a hard time with this because I'm telling you, we're living in a world right now, in a, in a church world right now, that is obsessing about the righteousness and having no mercy on the world. We're so concerned about the world's sin. We don't want that sin getting in the church. We don't want that sin getting into our homes. We don't wanna get that sin getting inside of our schools. And we are so self-righteous about so many things that are happening in society. When God says, it's not about society, it's about what's going on inside of your own heart. Because we're, we're, we're thinking about the outside. That's what the Bible says. People look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Hit your neighbor and say, God's looking right at your heart. God's looking at your heart. He's not looking at your outside appearance. You look good, but God's really looking at what's really on the inside of you. God sees the heart. So this is a big deal because all of us have those two fridges. We have that outward life that we're curating and Jesus is saying here, he says, blessed are you that go all in for righteousness. You got to go for it. Like give a year of your life. But in the process, don't become a self-righteous hypocrite. Remember that you've been given mercy and you've got to give mercy back. Really, it's not a call to be perfect. It's a call to be real. Like stop play acting, stop pretending. I mean, thank God he's given everybody in this room a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a sixth chance and a 12th chance and a, and a hundredth chance. And, you st and, you're, and you'll take that mercy for you. Well, why don't you give that mercy to others? That's why he says, blessed are the, the pure in heart, the undivided in heart, or the, the one that, that hasn't separated righteousness from mercy. I mean, 
Blessed is the one who, who's pure at heart because they're going to see some things. The problem is, is that when we're acting self-righteous, we lose our ability to see what's really going on. What happens is we get focused on the idols inside of our own heart. There's idols inside the heart. What do you mean by idols inside of the heart? Well, the scripture says that inside of the heart, it's not in the world, in the heart, out of a person's heart, come all, he uses this broad category of evil thoughts, which includes sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewd behavior, jealousy and envy, or gossip and slander. Ain't nobody has a problem with that anymore. Arrogance, foolishness, folly, all of those things are coming out from inside of the heart. And why are they coming out of the heart? Because we have idols in our heart. If you are part of freedom, part of our, one of our freedom groups, you know this because we just completed week five where we talk about the idols of the heart and how they're keeping us. We wonder, why, why am I doing the things that I'm doing that I don't even want to do? Well, part of that is because I have idols that are inside of the heart, and, when you, and, and everybody has them. You have one of these four that's probably a big deal for you. We've got things like selfishness, things like bitterness. So selfishness, it doesn't mean that you won't share. It means that life is all about you. Like you just think about yourself all the time, and the way you think is what's right. Listen, the way you experience things is just the way you experience it, but you can start thinking that the way I see things is the way that they are, and I'm right, and you make meaning about things, and you say, well, that's the right meaning, or you, you, you look at people and you assign motives to them. You don't know their heart, but you're right. I know what they're thinking. I know why they did that, and you can become a person that worships. You're not worshiping God. You're worshiping your own opinion about everything. You worship, your, you worship your view of the world, like I know that I'm right. So these Pharisees, they were playing God. They were declaring who's righteous and who's not. What's, who, who, who's, uh, who's right with God and who's not right with God. And they're constantly judging people. They're putting themselves in the place of the judge. And why that's happening is because there's an idol of self in the middle of the heart. How about this idol of bitterness? So that's something happened, made you mad hurt you, something happened that wounded your spirit, and you never could get past it. And you will see people today who live their lives, and that is, it's right there all the time, and the, the behavior is they're always trying to make people pay. So they don't forgive. In fact, it almost seems, have you ever seen a person that's perpetually angry, and they're perpetually upset, and it just takes the littlest thing, and they're gonna make, they're gonna take a little piece out of every person around them because they're just, they're just bitter. And that's an idol, that's, a, that, that's an attitude of, I am not gonna let anybody ever treat me this way ever again. And I will go on the offense, I'm on defense all the time, I'm gonna make people pay. So that's, that's somebody's life. And, and out of where there is selfish ambition and bitterness, the scripture says, out of that will flow every other disorder and behavior. Now how about rejection? This is one I relate to. I had this in my life because I grew up, I went to 12 different schools between kindergarten and, and my senior year. So you're moving a lot. And so that's a lot of, of moving around. You're trying to get the approval and the acceptance of everybody. And you're, I mean, it's not easy. And early on when I didn't figure this out, I felt rejection a lot. So my little story became, how do I get these people to like me and like them fast? So I'm, I'm taking the dare, I'm hilarious, I'm funny, I'm doing whatever I have to do. But the downside of that is you live your life as a performer. And it comes a time when you start to feel like you're just performing all the time and you feel very empty on the inside. And emptiness, that vacuum, wants to be filled by something. Which is why this other category of this evil thoughts, kind of the big general category, which is, well, what do I need for love? And what do I need for relief? And what do I need for comfort? And what do I need for escape? I don't know which one of these relate to you, but, but we all, there ain't nobody righteous. Everybody's got idols in their heart. I don't know why we act like, hey, we got it all buttoned up, we're good, but that's all of us. We, we are not righteous, we have, we have a sin nature, and we have the wounds of life, and, and we've, we've created idols that we worship, and it's part of our lives. 
So here's the thing about idols. Can I teach you about this today uh, real quickly? Can I just take you a little deeper? In Psalm 115, there's this beautiful insight by a songwriter. He wrote a song here, and he says, this is what's really going on when you have idols. He's referring to like when people actually made idols out of stone and wood or, or gold or silver. And he says, this is what happens when you make an idol. Like you're creating an idol. It has eyes, but it can't see. And it has ears, can't hear. And it has a mouth, but it can't say anything. It's mute. It, it has hands, but can't feel anything. I wonder how many people relate to that. Like, I don't understand myself at all. Why do I keep doing things I don't want to do? And why, I, I, and why is it that, that I keep making the same dumb mistakes? And why is it I've tried everything that I can think of to try and I still can't feel? Because the verse goes on to say, those who make idols will become like them, as will all who put their trust in them. We don't see this, but when we have idols in our heart that are unaddressed, we become senseless. We've lost our senses, can't hear, can't see. And so what's happening is, is we don't see God. We don't see what God has for us. Lots of people say, well, I've never seen God in my life. That's right, because you don't see God because all you see is your idols. You're thinking about self. You're caught up in your bitterness, caught up with getting people to like you and rejection and caught up with, the, with all the junk of the world. I mean, evil thoughts. I mean, what is that? That's just all of the addictions and the drinking and the websites and whatever else we do, you know, and we can't see God. Senseless. So what do we do? How do we get that out of our heart? That's a great question. How do you move that along? Well, Jesus tells a story to give us a picture of what that looks like. And he, and he pits the Pharisee, the, the hypocrite, the one who thinks that they're righteous because they've done all the right things. And he compares a person who's a tax collector, like a sellout, a sinner, someone that all of society looks, that's not a good man. And he puts the two of them in a, I think it was a real story. I think Jesus actually saw this happen. And he says, this is going to be a good illustration. And you remember Matthew who writes these Beatitudes down. He's actually, he was a tax collector. Maybe this is a story about Matthew. I don't know. But two men went up to the temple to pray, a Pharisee and a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and he prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like all these other jokers. God, I thank I thank you I'm not like the robbers. I thank you I'm not like the evildoers. God, I thank you I'm not an adulterer. And he would have said it like that, an adulterer. <laughs> I thank you that I'm not even like this tax collection. Can you believe that? He calls the guy out. And he, it's, it's the way we think. When we, we, you can't see God, you're just looking at, you're looking at your own life. I thank you that I'm not like this. I thank you that I'm this. I fast twice a week. I, I give a tenth of everything that I have. But the tax collector stood by himself, bent his head, humble before God, beating his chest. And he cries out and he says, God, <laughs> I have done nothing right. I've done everything wrong. I have no claim to righteousness. God, I need you. Something's got to change. Wait, I need to change. God, I want to go all in with you, but I need your mercy. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Do you see the progression? And what does God do for this guy? I tell you that this man, rather than the Pharisee, is the one who went home justified before God. What does that mean? Just as if he never sinned. God, God made him God made him right in God's sight, gave him a right heart, put a new spirit inside of him, like made him right. Meanwhile, why, why not the other guy? Because the other guy was just justifying himself. I thank you that I'm not like this and that. So you need to know that when the Bible says, blessed are the pure in heart, it's not about some one you know, random person that's managed to achieve perfection and purity in their heart. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, God, the pure in heart is the one who has decided, God, I need you. Something's got to change. God, I need to change. God, I'm, I'm going to go all in with you. I want to, I want to do what's right, but I need your mercy. 
God says, I'll give you the right heart. I'll change your heart. I'm telling you, if you'll just have a humble moment with God, God will heal. And he'll actually give you a brand new heart. So you don't have to try to be righteous. You're not trying to be pure anymore. You're just coming to God. So this is really a prayer about, I'm going to be righteous, but I'm going to be real at the same time. No more hypocrisy. No more playing this game of comparison and pitching myself against other people. No more pointing the finger at other people. I'll tell you a story of a man named Fred who came to this church years ago. But his story went like this. He was a successful business uh, leader in his company, big company. He was an IT leader. And he was working 60, 70 hours a week. Very successful. And to cope, he would start to drink at night just to relax. And it was no big deal, he said. But it began to affect his relationships at home. Didn't affect work at all. But, you know, two o'clock in the morning, still drinking. But nobody knew. He kept it under wraps. He thought that nobody could see it. It began to affect his relationships at home. And his wife said, you need to get help. And he said, I'm fine. I don't need any help. You know, leave me alone. And one day she did. And he woke up and she was gone. And he was left with the DUI he just got. And life came to a crash. And he said, I'm going to get some help. Now, mind you, he was a church guy. He was a deacon at his church. He taught Sunday school. He was a righteous, outwardly person, but he had this other thing going on that nobody knew. And he, ha- he knew, I can't tell those people at the church. So he decided to go to AA. You go to AA, and the first thing they say is, hey, my name is Fred, and I am an alcoholic. So you have to say, you know, hey, I, I'm in need of help. And six months later, he's, he's six months sober and his wife has come back and they're patching things up and life's going good. And so he decides, I'm going to tell my pastor at my church what's been happening. I'm going to share this victory that I've, I'm finally free from this addiction. <laughs> Only problem was it was Pastor Pharisee. And the pastor says, what are you, you have sin in your life? And you've never told us? Oh, and they stripped him of being a deacon and they said, you can't teach Sunday school anymore and you need to sit in a corner and we're taking your wife off too because obviously you all, you all have sin in your life. And not just long story short, the self-righteousness got under his skin and he goes, I ain't never going back. And for a decade, never went to church. And he hated pastors and he hated church people. Didn't, wasn't so much mad at God, but he was just done with the self-righteous behavior. Well, Fast forward, so his kids find this new church, Heartland Church, started coming here, and they dragged mom and dad to to Easter. And they didn't want to go. He didn't want to go. So after the service, he comes up to meet me with this kind of mean look on his face, like, you want real preacher? I'll give you real. And he just sort of like told me his life story, kind of like thumped me, like, what are you going to do about that? (laughs) Kind of like, reject me now if you're going to reject me. I ain't wasting my time with you. But the funny thing was, I had been praying for somebody just like him to come to our church. I reached over, I put my hand on his shoulder. I said, I'm so glad you're here. I've been praying for someone just like you to help me start a ministry to help people recover from their addictions. You know, I've been struggling with this rejection thing. And I think there are some principles that got you free in your life that I think could help me. And maybe we could help each other. Let's start a small group together. Here's the crazy thing about it. Do you think I lost any credibility in that moment by being real? You think that made me look bad for admitting that I have idols in my own heart that need to be dealt with? And I've been praying that God would send someone with some experience. That man became such a good friend of mine. And over six months, we did that group. And God did a great work of healing in his life, restoring him back to the church. He was in the last service sitting right over there. 17 years, my friend. But God did a work in my life too. This is my story. That what the scripture says is true. If you will just confess your sins, not just to God, but if you'll tell another person and then the two of you pray for each other, you will be healed. Because there's a humility in that, that God says, all right, I'm gonna help you. I'm gonna help you see. Blessed are the pure in heart, right? Not perfect. Blessed are the people who have stopped playing the, the, the self-righteous game. Blessed are the people who are 
who are holding on to righteousness in one hand, like I got to be right. I want to do the right thing, but I'm also going to be real. Yes. Now I'll let you see something. And what happens in that moment when you get real with God? Do you know what God will do for you? God will give you a new heart. Look what the scripture says prophetically about all of this. Back in Ezekiel, the spirit of God wrote through that man to say, one day God is going to give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit on the inside of you. I'll take out that heart of stone. What's that about? That's a reference to an idol that can't see, can't hear, can't think, can't like... I'll remove, that, I'll remove that thing that's causing you to be blind and dumb and senseless. I'll take that out of you and I'll give you a heart that can feel again. I'll give you a heart of flesh. I'll give you a heart that wants to do the right things. Because before, I'm, I, I don't want to do the right thing, but I'm trying to do the right and it's not working. And God says, if you would get humble, I will put a new heart in you that wants to do right and has compassion for others because you will have received it yourself. I love the verse that says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, <laughs> that's when finally I have real fellowship with other Christians. And I realize, you know what? The blood of Jesus does cover all sin. I'm telling you that if you will, if you will just do what this verse says, blessed are the pure in heart, which means this, I'm going after God with all that I've got but I'm also not going to be a hypocrite anymore. No more playing the game of self-righteousness. I'm going to be real. So it takes a decision. I ain't being a hypocrite anymore. I'm going to come to God just as I am. If you do this, you know what the promise is? You'll start to see God everywhere. It's like you never saw God before, but you're going to start seeing God on your job. You're going to start seeing God in your family. You'll start seeing God in your church. The light is going to come on. You're going to hear God speaking to you. Wouldn't you like to have God directing your steps and ordering your steps? Wouldn't you like to have the whisper of the Holy Spirit? Just here, do this. Go here. Stop. Touch. Uh, help this person. The fulfillment that would come in your life as you are operating the way you're supposed to be with God whispering to you and telling you what to do. <laughs> God blesses people who stop, who stop playing the, the self-righteous hypocrite game. I, I pray that our church will never look like that. I pray that none of you walk around throwing out your spiritual resumes <laughs> of all the things. Like just, I pray for a humble church. I pray for a church where all of us, including me, would say, hey, I'm going after God with all my heart, but I'm a man in need of mercy. And the mercy I've received, the mercy is what I'm going to give. So I want to pray a prayer for you today. And I, I don't know who I'm preaching to you today, but some of you, you need a new heart. You, you know it. You know that th those idols, when you saw them, you went, that's my idol. That's my thing. And how do you get rid of that? Well, you confess it. You, you say, I'm going to get real about that. Some of you who, who are in the freedom groups, listen, go all the way through with your freedom group and get to that freedom conference at the end and God's gonna set you free. And God's gonna set some of you free today just as I pray for you in just a moment. Because I'm gonna pray a prayer from scripture that is this whole message in one little verse, okay? I'm gonna pray this over you. And I just ask that if, if, I, if God is speaking to you today, you say, I need a new heart. I need a fresh start. I need a new beginning. If you're humble enough to admit, God, I recognize my need for you. Something's gotta change. Okay, I need a change. I'm gonna go on with God. I'm gonna need mercy. I'm gonna give mercy. God's gonna open your eyes. So here's the prayer. Bow your heads for just a moment. Or you can look at the screen if you want. But if you say, Pastor, you're talking to me. I need a new heart today. No one's looking at you. Just slip your hand up and say, Pastor, that's me. I need a new heart today. Just lift it up and put it back down. Yes, 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 yes. Up in the risers, I see your hand. I got you. Yep, yep. Yes, Father. Yes. Yes. I need a new heart. Just be just be humble. Just admit it. You're in a safe place. We all need, there's no one righteous, but you say today's the day. Yes, I see you. Too many hands to count now. 
So here's the prayer. God, I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ will give each person a spirit of wisdom and revelation. God, open their eyes in this moment. I pray that the eyes of the heart would just be enlightened. I pray that they will know you, God. I pray that they'll know you, not just know religion, I pray they will know you as a person, the God who loves them, who cares about them, who wants to guide them and speak to them. I pray that the eyes of their, of their, of their heart will be enlightened, that they can see you clearly. I pray that they will discover the hope of the calling that you have on their life. They've been so busy dealing with the idols, they're missing the calling of their life, but not anymore. God, I pray you'd lead them to their calling, and I pray that they would discover the glorious inheritance you have for them among your holy people, that they will make the difference that you've called them to make. You say, Pastor, that's me. I'm, I want that prayer in my life. Just say, yes, God, that is me. Come into my life. Come and change me. Come make me a new person. Say it this way, God, I just surrender my whole life to you. I'm going all in. Mercy, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I give you my life. Lord, for every person praying this prayer with me, I pray that as they keep walking with you, as they climb higher, as they keep walking on your way, as we keep learning these truths, Lord, change their life. May they not recognize themselves a year from now. Give them a pure heart that they can see you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, give God a great hand of praise, everybody. So proud of you.